Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to get into part two of the Congress of Vienna. I'm going to split this one into two parts also because it's an hour long, so that's way too long for one video. So I'll split it in half, but I'm going to do the first half today, the Congress of Vienna part two. At the end of the last one, we were talking about essentially the, the major powers trying to figure out how how Europe was going to, to mold itself going forward to keep massive revolution and war and, you know, all of the, all of the stuff they had been going through for the last, you know, two decades by this point, they're trying to figure out a way to, to smooth everything over going forward. And then of course you have Alexander the first of Russia coming in, Leroy Jenkins and everything and uh, I think it's a pretty good plan we should be able to pull it off this time uh, what do you think Abdul can you give me a number crunch real quick uh, yeah give me a sec I'm coming up with 32.33 uh, repeating of course percentage of survival oh, that's a lot better than we usually do uh, all right thumbs up ready guys let's or? do this Leroy Jenkins oh my god he just ran in Save him! Oh, geez, stick it clean! Oh, geez. Go. Let's go, let's go. Making deals with Napoleon and wanting to do all sorts of crazy stuff, so that's where we left off. Here's part two. Let's get into it. This is how the Congress of Vienna was organized. There was an eight-member central committee that would vote on the final treaty. This group included the five great powers, plus three secondary powers, Spain, Portugal, and Sweden, who each had played an important role in the victory over Napoleon. But the five great powers agreed to cut out the Central Committee by negotiating informally among themselves. If the great powers could hammer out a consensus, they could steamroll the Central Committee and the rest of the Congress. In the end, this was where the real power lie. Then there were a number of subcommittees, at least 12, that would go off to the side and debate isolated issues among themselves. When they reached a consensus, they would bring their proposal to the central committee for approval. Most of these subcommittees were pretty boring, which countries had shipping rights in which rivers, stuff like that. But the most important subcommittee was the German committee. This committee would be chaired by Metternich of Austria and would have members from every German state in Central Europe, including Prussia. Together, the German states would go away and collectively decide what Central Europe would look like in a post-Holy Roman Empire world. The negotiations that took place within the German committee were perhaps the most consequential of the entire Congress. Yeah, and this is a big deal, right? You have Prussia trying to, essentially trying to announce itself, not even announce itself, actually become part of like the world stage on the level of the great powers. They look at Austria as having that, even though Austria, Austria has a great representative here for the Congress. But Austria overall doesn't really hold the power that Prussia thinks it does. Um, but it does among it does hold power among the German states, right? And so obviously with the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, Prussia, uh, you know, Napoleon no longer has control of basically all of Europe. And so you've got to figure out what to do here, particularly with all of these German states that are kind of just left in no man's land after the war is over. The first roadblock was that the diplomats couldn't agree upon which map to use as a baseline for negotiations. As I've said before, none of these maps accurately reflected what was going on on the ground at the time. There were armies from every great power scattered all over Europe. 
The default map that Britain, Austria, and Russia wanted to use was the 1792 map, with some minor modifications. In other words, they wanted the default map to be France as it existed before any of its revolutionary wars of conquest. France and Prussia favored using 1806 as a starting point. This was when Prussia was at its beefiest, so obviously the land-hungry Prussians would push for this date. Talleyrand backing Prussia's 1806 proposal was a shrewd move, because not only would it result in an extra beefy France, but more importantly, it allowed Talleyrand to open the Congress by throwing a wedge into the anti-French alliance. There was always the danger of the four great powers ganging up on a defeated France and taking from them whatever they wanted. Hardenberg of Prussia even spoke of partitioning France, but with Talleyrand at the table, that yeah, and that's, you know, historically, that wouldn't be super uncommon. France has this massive war of conquest. They end up getting jumped, essentially, by the rest of Europe. It would not be historically uncommon for everybody to start taking their own pound of flesh out of France, right? So it makes sense that Talleyrand is worried about this. Again, I said this in the first one, but Talleyrand is sort of a, his like, a hilarious historical figure to me because you hear like because the the ideas on what kind of person or statesman or whatever he was are just polar opposite like literally polar opposite and so it's the back and forth is kind of funny but you can understand where he's coming from here it would make a ton of historical sense for everybody to just start taking bites out of French territory. It wasn't happening. By pulling Prussia away from the other great powers, Talleyrand was signaling to everybody that France was capable of making trouble. And if the other great powers wanted to reach a consensus, they would actually have to negotiate with France. Metternich and Castlereagh eventually talked Hardenberg down from his 1806 position. It's possible that they made certain informal promises regarding Prussian territorial expansion, but those details are lost to us. So it was decided that they would start with the old 1792 borders. But these brought with them a huge problem. Poland. A beefy Poland had existed in 1792, and if it were to be restored, it would come at the expense of Russia and Prussia. Prussia was land hungry and would not willingly let go of any of its Polish provinces without being compensated somewhere else. Russia didn't want Poland to exist at all, since it would serve as nothing more than a buffer between it and Central Europe. Metternich loved the idea of restoring Poland. Not only would it keep Russia out of Central Europe, but it would push Russia back from the Austrian border. Metternich was even willing to give up Austria's Polish-speaking provinces to make this happen. Castlereagh and Metternich pulled Hardenberg aside and came to a preliminary agreement over Poland. Prussia would give up its Polish-speaking provinces, but Castlereagh and Metternich promised to compensate for this with German-speaking provinces in Central Europe. The three of them came to a handshake agreement that Prussia would receive Saxony, along with several German cities to the west. Under this framework, Prussia's population would increase by 6%, and Poland would remain independent. All three were happy with this. When Tsar Alexander of Russia caught wind of this secret agreement, he threw a pretty public tantrum. He announced that he intended to keep 100% of Poland, including the Polish-speaking provinces currently held by Austria and Prussia. <laughs> These demands were extreme, and it was difficult to imagine Austria and Prussia simply handing their territory over to Russia for nothing. Talleyrand was also unhappy with the secret Poland agreement, and went to see Tsar Alexander privately. Talleyrand specifically wanted to preserve a strong and independent Saxony, since France and Saxony had traditionally been strong allies. Talleyrand made his pitch to the Russian Emperor. Alexander replied, 
I would rather have war than give up what I occupy. Um, I mean, everybody's got armies all across Europe. I feel like they should all just turn on him and stomp out Alexander while he's there. But, you know, we're trying to be diplomatic. Talleyrand was stunned when he heard this and asked for clarification. Yes, I would rather have war, Alexander said. Talleyrand began trying to talk the emperor down into a compromise, but before he could make any progress, Alexander stood up and declared, It's time for the theater. I have to go. He then gave Talleyrand an affectionate hug and ran off. After casually threatening a world war, the Russian emperor stayed out partying until four in the morning. God, he is literally just the worst. He, he sucks so bad. And it's impossible for anybody to rein him in. Talleyrand was appropriately alarmed at this behavior and informed the other great powers of Russia's intransigence. Harden um, Alexander's being a psycho, so we're going to have to figure this out. Like, I wonder how that conversation went. Berg began to fear that Prussia may be on the losing end of a conflict over Poland. So he began to move soldiers around to fortify the parts of Poland that they currently occupied. As if that isn't bad enough, Metternich then found out that his monarch was upset with him. The Austrian Emperor Francis summoned Metternich and chastised him for using the Kingdom of Saxony as a bargaining chip. Austria was trying to position itself internationally as the defender of the rule of law and the defender of the rights of smaller Central European states. They couldn't credibly do this if they sold their neighbors up the river at first opportunity. Emperor Francis told Metternich that the Kingdom of Saxony must survive the negotiations, and it must survive at at least half of its current size. This made Metternich's task infinitely more complex. Prussia must be convinced to take less of Saxony than they had been promised in their handshake deal. This meant that they would want to hold on to their Polish-speaking provinces. In order to make that work, Metternich would need to strike a deal with Tsar Alexander. Good luck. Metternich went to meet with Alexander, and things got heated. Metternich did not find the Russian emperor particularly intimidating, and spoke to him in the manner that he would speak to any other diplomat. Alexander wasn't really used to that, and after two long hours of back and forth, he jumped to his feet, marched over to Metternich, and challenged him to a duel. <laughs> this kind of thing was above Metternich's pay grade and required the personal intervention of the Austrian emperor. I, he should have just done it. He should have just taken the offer and been like, all right, this is a win-win situation. If he kills me, I'm out of this whole thing. So none of this matters to me anyway. If I win, Alexander's now out of this and we can negotiate, you know, without the giant, giant wild card in the room. Francis of Austria soothed Alexander's ego by saying that of course he would win a duel against Metternich, but murdering the Austrian foreign minister might cause an international incident. Recall Metternich's first impression of Alexander, the biggest baby on earth. Was he wrong? After this incident, Alexander <laughs> would privately describe Metternich as, quote, a permanent obstacle and, quote, a sworn enemy. The feeling was mutual. Russia was apparently a dead end, so Metternich went to Prussia next. Metternich explained to Hardenberg that he could now only give Prussia half of Saxony. This was not what they had agreed to, and Hardenberg was understandably upset. The two diplomats parted ways with sore feelings and no agreement. The entire deal over Poland seemed to be dead, or at least dying, and the prospect of war with Russia was becoming a growing concern. In desperation, Metternich brought Britain and France into the negotiations. 
He thought that if three great powers could bring a compromise to the other two, they might be pressured into accepting it. Castlereagh went to see Alexander. He explained to the Russian Tsar that Britain would not accept a Poland under Russian domination. The British public demanded an independent Poland. Alexander finally let his guard down, or at least pretended to, and confessed to Castlereagh that the war with Napoleon had left him in a precarious situation back in Russia. The Russians had sacrificed everything to defeat Napoleon, and the Russian aristocracy felt that they deserved Poland as a reward. Alexander doesn't come right out and say this, but he hints that he had promised them exactly that before he left. The implication was that there may be a coup if he went back empty-handed. Castlereagh explained to Alexander that if he took Poland without the consent of the other great powers, it would not end well for him. Prussia and Austria would become permanent enemies of Russia and natural allies to the occupied Polish population. One way or another, Poland would be free. It seemed that negotiations were approaching an impasse. And then disaster struck. News got out that the Prussian king had publicly signed off on the Russian annexation of Poland. Tsar Alexander had been personally negotiating with him in secret. Hardenberg was inconsolable. His own king had just stabbed him in the back. It was humiliating. What made matters worse was that the Prussian king was too stupid to realize he wasn't helping. Wow, so everybody is trying to get Alexander to concede Poland. Like, this is a lose-lose situation no matter what. If you take it, you're going to have issues with the Polish population, and the Prussians and Austrians are both going to be backing that population, right? Also, none of the great powers want you to have Poland. So you're going to be an enemy of the rest of the, the great powers here. Alexander essentially goes and starts negotiating with everybody but the people at the Congress, which is the most Alexander thing ever. God, I cannot imagine having, having to deal with this dude. Like, I don't know. At least the, the rest aren't monarchs. So, like, there's some level of realism or pragmatism to them. But, I mean, Jesus. He's just so brutal. This turn of events lit a fire under the members of the Congress. Castlereagh grabbed Hardenberg and said that if Hardenberg could get the Prussian king to walk back those Poland comments, then Britain would be prepared to back Prussia's demand to annex 100% of Saxony. Hardenberg agreed and marched off to wrestle back control of his monarch. Metternich stayed strategically silent during this exchange. He had secretly written to Castlereagh and promised Austrian support in this scheme, even though it was in direct violation of his emperor's instructions to preserve at least half of Saxony. I probably would have said it instead of written it, you know, since it's literally the exact opposite of what the Austrian monarch just told you to do. But all things considered... I mean, you've you've got to you've got to figure out a way to get the Prussian monarch out of this. He literally just threw the world's biggest wrench into the gears here. You've you've got to get him, you know. You've got to get him to back off. But that was a problem for another day. And just like that, because of Russian overreach. Britain, France, Prussia, and Austria were all on the same page when it came to Poland. It was four against one. With newfound urgency, the four powers came together and drafted three possible options to resolve the Poland crisis. Option number one called for an enlarged Poland, which would include the Polish-speaking provinces from Russia, Austria, and Prussia. 
Option number two called for a reduced Poland, where Russia, Austria, and Prussia each held on to their Polish-speaking provinces. Option number three called for a full partition, where Russia, Austria, and Prussia would come in and divide Poland three ways. Under this plan, the people of Poland would have certain political protections across all three countries. You might notice that there was no option in which Russia got to keep all of Poland. That yeah, was on purpose. No. Talleyrand was selected to go and present these options to the Russian Tsar. He explained to Alexander that France's official position was that there should be an independent Poland. He said that if Russia acted on its own and annexed Poland, Prussia and Austria would have no choice but to seriously consider a potential war with Russia. In such a scenario, both would seek to strengthen themselves through territorial expansion. If three of the great powers were going around Europe gobbling up territory, France and Britain would have no choice but to intervene. Talleyrand was very clear with Alexander. If he took Poland by force, the great powers would go to war. Alexander was growing frustrated with this constant diplomatic meddling and finally snapped. I have 200,000 men in the Duchy of Warsaw, aka Poland, and I would like to see anyone try to drive me out of it. I have given Prussia Saxony, and Austria consents to it. Alexander had spies everywhere, and apparently he knew that Saxony was secretly being used as a bargaining chip. Talleyrand feigned innocence and asked an innocent question. How could Prussia annex Saxony when they had no claim to the Saxon throne? Alexander responded, If the king of Saxony will not abdicate, he will be packed off to Russia. He will die there. This was an open threat of violence against another monarch, and it was not the answer that Talleyrand was expecting. After a pause, he responded with caution. The Congress was not assembled to witness a violent assault of this kind. At this, Alexander truly lost his temper. Do you really think I give much weight to all your parchments and treaties? The King of Prussia will be the King of Prussia and Saxony, just as I will be the Emperor of Russia and the King of Poland. With that, he stormed out of the room, leaving Talleyrand alone with his thoughts. When Metternich learned of Alexander's outburst, he finally lost his patience. He decided to meet once more with the Russian Tsar, this time with a different negotiating tactic. Here we go. He told Alexander that Austria was considering unilaterally selecting a Polish king to rule over an independent Poland. This was an unspoken threat. Metternich was telling Alexander that all he had to do was snap his fingers, and Poland would rise up against Russian occupation. Alexander responded by issuing an unspoken threat of his own. He invited Metternich to come to Poland and inspect the Russian soldiers stationed there, all 200,000 of them. Metternich then dropped the subtlety. He flatly told Alexander that if he took Poland, the entire Congress of Vienna would be against him. Yeah, that's, that's what I feel like Alexander doesn't understand. Nobody is going to watch you do this. Like, okay, you have 200,000 troops there. That will probably be enough to hold down the Polish population. But everybody here has armies now because they just fought Napoleon. Like, the idea that Russia has an army and so they can't be stopped, like, I don't understand. I, I literally don't understand. They, the major powers just stopped Napoleon. Why, like, why in the world would you think that that couldn't be done to you? I just don't understand. I know that Alexander sees himself very highly in his own head, but surely, surely he understands that he's not Napoleon on a battlefield. Like, I'm so confused about what he thinks is going to happen here. 
Like you're going to get jumped by all of the militaries in all of the other powers of this Congress. Like they're not letting you take Poland. Jesus. After this, tempers flared, voices were raised, and things got personal. From this moment on, Metternich would refuse to be in the same room with the Russian Tsar unless others were present, which frankly is exactly the kind of grudge that I respect. <laughs> and then a very troubling thing happened. Without notice, the Russian soldiers in Saxony began to pull back and leave. Shortly after this, the Prussian soldiers occupying parts of Poland did the same. All of a sudden, there was a lot of military movement, and nobody knew why. Within a matter of weeks, a lot more Prussian soldiers entered Saxony, and a lot more Russian soldiers entered Poland. It became clear that there was some kind of handoff happening, a secret agreement between Russia and Prussia. Both were openly fortifying their positions and preparing for war. Bad, bad, bad. Castle Ray wrote a summary of these events to Prime Minister Liverpool back in Britain. Quote, Unless the Emperor of Russia can be brought to a more moderate and sound course of public conduct, the peace which we have so dearly purchased will be but of a short duration. You must make up your mind to watch him and resist him if necessary, as another Bonaparte. Back in Britain, the domestic political situation was approaching a boiling point. The narrow, conservative Whig majority in the House of Commons was in jeopardy. The liberal Whig opposition had weaponized the Saxony and Poland crisis and were using it as a rallying cry against authoritarianism everywhere. The liberals had the public on their side, and now they were calling for an independent Saxony and an independent Poland with no concessions to the other powers whatsoever. Liverpool was in a precarious situation and could not appear to be throwing the people of Poland to the Russian wolves, or bears or whatever. The liberals wanted to paint Liverpool as sympathetic to the Russian tyrant, and so Liverpool needed to prove them wrong. He wrote to Castlereagh, instructing him to back away from any deal that would partition Saxony or Poland. The official British position would now call for full independence for both countries. You would think that such an abrupt shift in priorities would blow up the negotiations, but it really didn't. After being stabbed in the back by Russia and Prussia, Metternich felt no obligation to bend over backwards for them anymore. The Austrian Emperor had always wanted an independent Saxony, and Metternich had always wanted an independent Poland, so he joined the British in calling for both. Talleyrand had always favored full independence for both countries, and quickly followed Metternich's lead. This audacious show of force from Russia and Prussia spooked every small and medium-sized state in Central Europe. If Saxony could get steamrolled like this, nobody was safe. Virtually every Central European state found their courage and backed Castlereagh and Metternich's call for an independent Saxony and an independent Poland. Austria had long sought to position itself as the defender of precedent and tradition and the rule of law, and now that strategy was paying off. Metternich suddenly found himself at the center of attention, the most popular guy in Vienna, the hub to which every Central European state wanted to attach itself. When the dust settled, it became clear that Russia and Prussia's power grab had been a massive blunder. Tsar Alexander must have realized that he had backed himself into a corner, because he began sending signals to Austria that he might be satisfied with less than 100% of Poland. This was exactly the sort of opening that everyone was waiting for. Attention then turned to Prussia. There were reports that Prussia was building fortifications inside of occupied Saxony, which drew broad international condemnation. It soon became conspicuous that Tsar Alexander was remaining silent. Prussia was being left hanging out to dry. 
A desperate Hardenberg visited Talleyrand and tried to get him to break away from the other powers by making wild promises. At one point, Hardenberg offered France the Netherlands, which of course was a red line for Britain, and not something that Hardenberg was in a position to give away. Talleyrand wisely turned him down. Hardenberg was out of options. He backed down from his maximalist position and began telling people that he would accept no less than half of Saxony. Metternich jumped at this. An independent Saxony at half of its current size would satisfy both the Austrian Emperor and all of those smaller Central European states. After some back and forth over specifics, an agreement was reached. Prussia would receive half of Saxony, along with some German-speaking territory along the Rhine. A reduced Saxony would remain fully independent, and war would be averted. But then there was still the issue with Poland. Alexander reopened negotiations by offering to let Austria and Prussia keep their Polish-speaking provinces. A real change of tune from last time. Castlereagh then called for the creation of a strong Polish constitution built upon liberal democratic values. Tsar Alexander immediately agreed and publicly thanked Castlereagh for his advocacy on behalf of the people of Poland? If you find Alexander's change in demeanor a little shocking, you aren't alone. It's clear that there were some back-channel talks going on during the Saxony crisis, and it seems that concessions were made in order to get Alexander to back off and throw Prussia under the bus. What was happening now over Poland seemed well choreographed, as if it had all been drawn up in some back room somewhere. The great powers quickly reached an agreement over Poland, and it looked like this. Austria and Prussia would be allowed to keep their Polish-speaking provinces. The rest would become the Kingdom of Poland. The new kingdom would have a strong liberal democratic constitution, with an independent legislature, independent courts, and an independent army. The King of Poland would be a quasi-ceremonial role, tightly constrained by the Polish constitution. Under this deal, it was decided that Tsar Alexander of Russia would separately and simultaneously become the King of Poland. On paper, this satisfied the British and Austrian demands for an independent Poland, since the new kingdom retained the right to make its own laws and field its own military. It also satisfied Alexander's demand to take Poland as a prize for defeating Napoleon. But obviously, Poland could not be truly independent under this arrangement. Yeah. With the Russian emperor as their king, it became impossible for Poland to resist creeping Russian influence. For the rest of Alexander's reign, he would chip away at Poland's independent political institutions and slowly work towards swallowing Poland into the Russian Empire. Who could have possibly seen that coming? Right? Who could have possibly seen that coming? That Alexander was going to agree to all of this, get what he wanted with Poland, and then be like, yeah, but, I mean, Poland is mine, so I can basically do whatever I want. I mean, considering the situation, this is probably the best that, that everybody could have hoped for. But it's, it's kind of selling everything as something that it's really not. Like, the independent Saxony is being sold as something that it's really not. Austria even being some quasi-protector of liberalism and, and tradition and demo Like, that's all something it's really not. Britain's is political in nature. France's is geopolitical in nature. It's just, this is all kind of a facade but it's, it's stitched together well enough in the back room that at least everybody can, can kind of come to terms with it. By the time his successor came to the throne, the new Russian emperor declared that he no longer felt bound by the Polish constitution. And then that was that. It's undeniable that Castlereagh and Metternich sacrificed Poland for an independent Saxony. Perhaps they saw the writing on the wall. 
The truth was that if Russia took Poland by force, Austria and Britain really weren't in a position to take it back. Perhaps they decided that if they couldn't stop Russia from taking Poland, they could turn the whole thing into a poison pill. As an island of liberalism within the Russian Empire, Poland would confound and distract Tsar Alexander for the rest of his reign. The Poland and Saxony crisis brought the great powers back to the brink of war. Okay, so this is where I'm going to stop it. I'll do the rest uh, tomorrow. But yeah, I've, this has been a really good two-part series. It's, you know, when you know what's coming in the future, a lot of this stuff is kind of setting the table, right? Setting the table for the situation that is to come. And honestly, in the back of my head, I keep thinking that in regards to Austria and Prussia. I keep thinking like, you know, every time that Austria does something that's either against Prussia or is a leg up on Prussia, I keep thinking like Prussia is one, you know, great dice roll of a politician away from from totally usurping Austria on the European stage. And that dice roll is coming decently quickly right in in Otto von Bismarck so but this is where we'll stop it uh, as always like comment subscribe help me keep building the channel over here I'll put the link to the discord down below and I'll see you all next time